And good evening, everyone, and welcome to the program. I'm your host, Joe Basha, and the program, of course, is Perf Web, and it's where you can get your Category 1 CEUs from the comfort of your home in the evening times. I hope this is a good time. I'd like to know. I'm going to send those evaluations out, get that back. Our program tonight is on CRRT and CVVH and fluid balance and inflammatory mediator removal and all of that kind of stuff and is approved for 2.5 category one abcp ceus and my guest today you've you worked with before have seen before on the program is patrick o'toole and of course patrick uses crrt frequently for our with our echo patients i know there's some controversy about that but uh, we'll discuss that. I've got a presentation I'm going to give first, Patrick, and then after that I'm going to uh, open it up and you and I can have a discussion about your experience with this. Because I will endeavor to say that very few of our perfusion colleagues actually use CRRT, to be frank with you. Uh, but, run it themselves? Yeah. No, no, yeah. not many at all. Yeah. What I'm surprised about, maybe you'll touch on this, is that, uh, that dialysis experts don't want to do this dialysis specialists yeah and that's another good point but i didn't finish my opening okay, I didn't right, finish right. my opening remarks i'm sorry everybody out there okay a couple of things that i have to go through for you to become a part of our community i need you to do these few things right now the first is click the subscribe button there it is <laughs> click that button click 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 okay we need you to do that very important also you can download our flyer let me show you our flyer first and it's a fun little flyer and if you go take that fly if you go to the youtube chat tool which you should have opened out anyway which is where you could ask questions and stuff you'll see there's a link right there there it is pointing the wrong way there you go right there you see that link Click that link and you can download our flyer. Also, if you would please like us on Facebook. If you go to Facebook, and here I'm pointing, there it is, there, there's the Facebook logo, the thumbs up. The New Orleans Conference on Facebook, please like us there. And a lot of good information that we put on there, so definitely do it. Also, you can call in. Please wait until you see this notice with our telephone number, 281-738-7906. And you can call in. I've got the phone right here. If you have any questions, want to become part of the discussion, but please wait until you see that notification. Also, make sure you turn your volume down on the device you're watching the program from, or you know what's going to happen. There's going to be a lot of feedback, and it's going to be not a pleasant experience for anybody. Um, the YouTube chat feature, I showed you that already. Let me show it to you one more time. If you go to the YouTube chat feature right there, you can ask questions. I've already put a couple of mentions up. And look, Timothy Bucky, what is coming and when? I don't know, Timothy, what that exactly means, but we're already getting a couple of chats there. I appreciate that. Oh, and that reminds me, we have these really, really, really neat bugs right here. Okay, now I know there's a couple of you out there that I already promised some of these super fancy mugs to, but I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to get them out to you, and anyone who sends us a good question or calls in tonight will get one of these mugs sent to you. Now, I know I promised a few of them, and I haven't gotten them to you yet, but I promise you we are going to do that this week. I, pr I give you my word. Okay. Uh, so let's go ahead and get the show going. I'm going to go ahead and switch over to my presentation at this point in time, and we'll go ahead and get the party started in that regard. And as I said, my talk to this evening is on CRRT, and what is it, and why should we um, use it more? I think we should use it more, especially on very, criti very critical patients. It's really intended originally to be an ICU tool. Um, that's kind of how it started. It actually started with nephrology, um, but it has since sort of morphed away from them, and there's a lot of controversy surrounding it. I am a true believer, however. Um, first thing I want to talk about is what are these various therapies? Because we're going to talk about CRRT and how it relates to dialysis. 
but really we're talking about intermittent therapies versus continuous therapies. So on the intermittent side, which you see right here, is peritoneal dialysis, hemodialysis, SLED, which is slow, low efficiency or sustained low efficiency, either one, dialysis. And it was basically companies who didn't have true CRRT's way of trying to mimic it by doing these long, low efficiency dialysis runs, but it truly is not the same. I'm going to show, explain to you why and, and, and go through that. Um, and any of uh, these various things. And on the continuous side, you have peritoneal dialysis, which I don't know why that's on there. It really shouldn't be. But CRRT, ultrafiltration, hemofiltration, hemodialysis, and with CVVHD, which is continuous veno veno hemodialysis, <laughs> and hemodiafiltration, CVVHADF. And we're not going to really spend much time talking about plasma absorption and MARS and stuff like that, which is more for liver and other inflammatory mediators. But we're going to talk a little bit more about specifically these things here in this section. That's what we're really here to talk about today. And let's see. My thing is uh, locked up here. Oh, there it goes. Okay. So to do dialysis in the ICU that is continuous, you want to, first of all, choose the right thing because you can do intermittent dialysis in many circumstances. CRRT is not for everybody. Um, you want to individualize the therapy to the patient. If the patient is very, very, very hypotensive, then you put them on intermittent dialysis and you will find that they become even more hemodynamically unstable. Generally, you have to stop the intermittent dialysis run and the, basically the patient does not get treated. Um, if you have a patient who has a, a closed head injury, for example, and you put that patient on uh, hemodialysis, you can develop dialysis dis disequilibrium syndrome or DDS, and you can even further exacerbate an already elevated intracranial hypertensive situation. And it can result in some pretty bad things happening, including mortality. Uh, patients who are extremely sensitive to volume status and their requirements, when you try doing intermittent, again, you're doing it over a very brief period of time, and that can result in some, uh, some real problems in terms of hemodynamic instability. You want to make sure you do it well um, and uh, efficiently and safely. You want to ensure good metabolic control, ensure adequate dosing, minimize the downtime of the therapy and ensure good volume control. Volume overload is evil. And I'm gonna say that twice. I'm gonna actually add that in this next slide. CVVH and ECMO is really interesting because you can integrate it directly into the circuit. And it's very beneficial, which I'll show you, in maintaining homeostasis, acid-base balance. It removes lactate, fluid management uh, uh, balance, fluid management and balance, electrolyte disturbances it can correct. But it does it over a longer period of time. It doesn't have to be done in a two, three, or four-hour period, as is the case with traditional intermittent hemodialysis. And again, I said, I was going to say it twice, ensure good volume control, volume overload is evil. We have all, at one time or another, seen this patient. And this patient is severely, grossly fluid overloaded. In fact, the uh, upper portion of her eyelids appear to be water balloons. This is not an uncommon appearance. And, you know, this is clearly anasarca at its finest. And there's a saying, um, and I'm, I can't quote, I can't give the person credit who said this, but somebody had taught me this saying that anasarca is not simply a visually displeasing uh, problem. That w if you look like that on the outside, all of your end organs 
also look like that. And that's something that you have to consider, the heart, the lungs, the liver, the, 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 the pancreas, the, uh, the kidneys, everything. So you wonder why patients that are this massively fluid, over, fluid overloaded go into uh, a multi-organ system failure. It's not a hard thing to imagine that the perfusion to the tissue of the organ, the end organs, is going to be compromised with essentially what becomes a, a global uh, uh, compartment syndrome, if you will. So there's a variety of machines out there. This happens to be a type of machine that I personally like. It's one that I have a lot of experience with. Um, it has some distinct advantages and some, uh, it has some disadvantages. I'm gonna talk about both. So anyway, who's, who makes this is uh, Baxter Gambro and it's called the Prismaflex. And it is a, a, uh, a gravimetric uh, device. And what that means is that each of those bags that you see down here are on scales. So you have replacement fluid bags here and you have an effluent or waste bag here. And these are five liter bags. And all of these measurements, all of these weights have to be equal so that if you're adding X amount from one bag and you want it to be zero balance, well, that amount had better be over in this bag by weight or the system is going to alarm. Um, so I, I see that as an advantage, but you know, again, um, if you bump it, uh, that makes it alarm and shut off and you have to reset it. Um, if the scales go bad, it's going to be a problem. Of course, you know, that's something you need to recalibrate them. Um, you're changing bags. The, the physical, the, the labor intensiveness of this particular device is much higher than another one that I'm going to show you. But regardless of that, what I'm trying to convey in this slide is you can have a brilliant machine, but if the person running it is like the, the, the clinician that you see on the right, then it doesn't matter how brilliant the machine is. You have to program it properly. If you have garbage in, you're gonna have garbage out is I guess what my message is. Here is another device. This is made by uh, Next Stage, and you can see that it has a little bit different design. It is a volumetric system. Um, it can hold up to five five liter bags here. It hangs like on an IV pole, not necessarily on a desktop, but you can see it's relative, it's pretty small footprint on this compared to the other one. Um, originally was designed as a home dialysis unit actually, and then modified to be a CRT a machine. It will do everything the other does, but this is volumetric. So it, meaning that basically each pump has a stroke volume and uh, it counts the stroke, it counts the number of RPMs and it calculates the volume from that regard. Um, another potential advantage, which could also be a disadvantage, is that you put the waste into a sink um, and so you don't have to change the waste bags all of the time. So it decreases the labor intensity of it. However, you also have to consider, you know, is it accurate? Now, I've had some people tell me, some nephrologists who are very, very strong CRT users, that studies that they've done have shown that the volumetric was equal to and maybe even more accurate than the gravimetric, but I, I, I'm not really sure about that. Regardless, I wanted to point out that there are different technologies, not one technology exists, and each of them have advantages and disadvantages. You have to decide what's going to be best for you. The other thing, too, is that the next stage machine, I will say, does not integrate into the ECMO as easily. It can be done but it takes a little finagling. The uh, Baxter Gambro Prismaflex machine does integrate in much more easily. And uh, uh, in that regard, I do think that it, at this point, is the better machine. Um, CRRT is, in fact, a, uh, an alphabet soup. You have SCUF, CVVH, CVVHD, CVVHDF, MUF, uh, where does it end? You know, it's hard to say, but let's talk about these different therapeutic modalities. Well, we're all familiar with diffusion, right? Hemodialysis essentially relies on diffusion. 
I'm not going to go over the slide. We all know the, what, what high concentration and low concentration is and how that all works. So I'm just going to, to, uh, to skip that. But I am going to say that when you do continuous dialysis with a CRRT machine, that you will have both diffusive clearance and some level of adsorption. So some of the inflammatory mediators that are too big to cross over will stick to the fiber bundle and uh, eventually clog it up if it's high enough. So it's one of the things that you can do when you have a patient who is in, 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 in fulminating SIRS, you can put them on a device. And you'll frequently have to make changes to the, um, to the filter if they have very, very high inflammatory mediator load. And of course, you're gonna do some ultrafiltration with it so you can remove volume from that as well. Um, let's see. And okay, so CVVHD, which I think, frankly, makes no sense whatsoever, but some people do use it. I wanna bring it up. It's continuous veno veno hemodialysis. It relies only on diffusion. It's for fluid removal, small solute removal molecules. It does have countercurrent flow, diffusive, and back filtration, and you can, of course, ultrafiltrate with it. But this is essentially no better than dialysis uh, in that regard. So then there's scuff, basically the same as muff. It's just essentially the same thing as us cutting a hemoconcentrator into our perfusion circuit. And it is just for fluid removal, nothing else. Keep in mind something that people don't get very often, they don't figure this out that well, is that the fluid of the effluent is isoosmotic. So that if the potassium of the blood plasma is four, the potassium of it will be four, the effluent. You never, you cannot affect any electrolyte when the fluid removed is isoosmotic. Something that people forget about and they think, oh, well, I'm affecting something, but you're not. You're doing nothing. All you're doing is concentrating the, the fluid compartment and nothing else. But what does that all mean to us? Well, you look at uh, dialysis. Dialysis essentially removes what you see there. If you look at the top part of this right here, little, very small molecules, and then as the molecules get larger and larger, well, dialysis diffusive clearance cannot clear it. So by the time you get to myoglobin, actually under myoglobin, at 17,000 Daltons, dialysis absolutely cannot clear that. But when you look at what the kidney normally does, you can see that its ability to remove molecules is much, they can remove much, much, much larger molecules. So all of this area that you see here in the blue essentially is an opportunity, but it's also an opportunity for a better technology, which we're here to discuss. But it also, if you look at inflammatory mediators, they generally live in the 17, 20, 25, 30, 35,000 Dalton range. Now there's some that are much, much larger than that and they need to be removed um, with adsorption therapy as opposed to maybe even plasma ad adsorption therapy, but that's another topic for another day. Right now we're gonna talk about those pro-inflammatory mediators that can be removed. Now I'll also say, the anti-inflammatory mediators will be removed also, something that you need to take into consideration. For every yin, there's a yang, but if you have a grossly <laughs> elevated level of pro-inflammatory mediators and a depressed level of anti-inflammatory mediators, and you're removing a block of volume containing both, you are disproportionately clearing the, the pro-inflammatory mediators at a greater level until you can get it reduced to a point where the anti-inflammatory mediator process can start to balance the patient out with its own natural homeostasis. So this is what convection looks like. You have blood going in, you have the little pipe, little, little, little straw fibers of a hemo, essentially a hemoconcentrator, and then blood coming back out to the patient, and you have a very high pressure on the blood phase. You have, a, you have pores in the straws, in the fibers, 
of $50,000. So what that's going to do is generate a pressure that is going to push the plasma water through the pores of the fibers to the waste and then out. So instead of a concentration gradient, as you can see, it is a pressure gradient. Very different. It's not that you create a negative pressure on one side and want to suck it through. You actually want the pressure on the blood side to push the ultrafiltrated uh, plasma water through the pores of the fiber. That's how it's intended to work. And there is a pump on these machines for the effluent, which is actually used as a dam to control the speed in which you're removing the fluid, as opposed to something that sucks it across. So when you look at CDVH, which is my personal favorite therapeutic modality. It is used for fluid removal, fluid replacement, solute clearance, convective clearance, and a minor amount of diffusion. So you see the difference there, very minor amount of diffusion. But you see the red access coming in and then the blue going out back to the return. And this is something else. In the di in perfusion world, red is always I was gonna say that. left. Yeah. In the dialysis world, it's opposite. Access is red as opposed to, in our world, red return. So keep that in mind. When you're looking at a dialysis catheter, the red is the access, the blue is the return. And that's because it's been concentrated and that's how they distinguish those colors. But it's exactly opposite of what we're used to. And then you have, you see the replacement and the replacement in the magenta can be pre, but it can also be post down here. And then you have the effluent. And what's important about that, I kind of, oh, I'm sorry, let me go back. What's important, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm moving the mouse on my screen like a dummy and not on this one. So I'm pointing to something on my computer and you all don't see that. Okay, I'm sorry. That was my mistake. So what's really important about this is that if you're returning it pre-filter, you're pre-diluting it before the blood is ultrafiltrated. But if you put the replacement post-filter, then you maximize your clearance. So what the trick with CVVH is, is to balance where this replacement goes. If you put it pre because it dilutes it, you have less likelihood of clogging and clotting your filter. If you put it, but you reduce your clearance. If you put it post, you increase your clearance, but you have more hyper-concentrated blood by the time it gets to this point, and your filter life may not be quite as long. So something to take into consideration there. And I'm sorry about the mouse thing. I just, I, I was using my mouse on the computer and it's a different computer that's running the arrow. So I apologize for that, but you probably got the message. Um, here we have CVVHD. We talked about that already. I think it's pointless. I don't know why anybody does it. And then you have CVVHDF. And I believe the only thing that CVVHDF is actually good for is basically in using all of the pumps and fluids that are available in the circuit to increase the amount of, uh, of, of therapy by milliliters per kilogram per hour. And I'll talk about how that works um, as we go forward because you're using all of the pumps. I, I frankly, I think C if CVVH isn't going to work, um, CVVHDF, I, you know, I, I, I think you can get everything done with CVVH, uh, but CVHDF is a therapeutic modality that does exist and you're going to have both diffusive clearance, convective clearance, and it takes both small and larger uh, molecules. But of course, if you're using CVVH, if you're using convection, you are removing all of the small and large molecules. It's not differentiating and saying only taking the large one. It's taking them all. If it's in the plasma water, it's coming out. That's the way it were, up to 50,000 Daltons, keeping that in mind, which albumin is, is higher than 50,000 Daltons, and therefore that's why you only remove plasma water, you don't remove plasma, right? We all know that already. So what is the rationale? Why do we do this? Well, the, we, CRRT became popular to 
try and overcome the shortcomings that exist with IHD that I talked about earlier. Fluid shifts, when they're done over a very short period of times, are very, very, very hard to do, and they're hard on the patient. Um, in addition to that, you know, we talked about the, uh, the, the uh, 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 cranial hypertension, which can be a huge problem. Um, so intermittent dialysis, even when done well, if the patient is unstable, in fact, sometimes they will say we cannot dialyze the patient, the patient's too sick to dialyze. That actually does happen because it can be very destabilized. But the ideal or artificial organ should mimic the native organ and restore homeostasis. CRRT is much more physiologic in that it is continuous. It's slow. It's over the course of a couple of days and even a week. So there's far less abrupt shifts. Um, the ICU patients who are acutely ill, bend bound, and intolerant of fluid and electrolyte swings that are associated with IHD are very good candidates for CRRT therapy. So let's look at some of these molecules. I told you albumin's at 55,000 to 66,000 Daltons. The middle molecules, and I want you to focus on down here, TNF-alpha and uh, C-reactive protein CRP that are both in the 25,000 Dalton range. So these middle molecules in this range contain a lot of pro-inflammatory mediators that intermittent dialysis simply cannot remove. Now, intermittent does great removing these, but we remove them too when you use, or you, you remove them also with convective therapy, probably a more appropriate way for me to say that. So the effectiveness of any artificial organ is based upon its ability to mimic the native organs. So let's go back and look at this slide again and include CVVH and convective clearance. Look at how much of that blue is now taken up from the CVVH. You can see that it's much closer. Now, it's not as, it's not the kidney. The kidney is the kidney. That's a special organ. But it certainly is a lot closer to it than what you, what dialysis would lose. So the blue represents essentially the, the, the gap between dialysis and CVVH. Can I interrupt and ask a question? Yeah, please. Uh, what why is that? Is it pore size or is it, how is it able to Diffusive be? Diffusive versus convective clearance. Just those two differences. If you're depending okay. only on a concentration gradient, it's a great mm -hmm. question. If you're depending solely on a concentration gradient, the pore size of a dialysis filter is 50,000 Daltons. It's exactly the same. But a concentration gradient can't force those larger molecules over. So it does very well with you know, urea and creatinine and potassium or whatever else you want to pull across, smaller molecules. But when you start getting into the 25 and 30,000 Dalton range, you have to have a pressure gradient to push it across with that solvent drag that I, I talked see. about. Okay. That's a very good question, though. I appreciate it. So here is a basic circuit that you can look at. So you can see, again, the access is red, and you can have a pre-blood pump, which you frequently use if you want to do citrate protocol, which regionally anticoagulates versus systemic anticoagulation. But we, we, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as we go forward. You've got the blood pump coming down, and then here you have the return going back up to the patients. You can have post-filter replacement. I talked about how important that is for clearance. You have your effluent here coming down. You have dialysate going through. You have pre-filter replacement here. So this is an example of CVVH DF in essence. It's everything. If it's just CVVH, then you have a post, or you have either a pre or post filter replacement on one particular pump, or it could be two. You can actually run it 50-50 and have 50% of it pre, 50% of it post, and your effluent, but you don't use the dialysate and you don't use the pre blood pump unless you're using citrate protocol. We're going to talk about that again as we move forward. I, I really, I really recommend that you um, learn more about this therapeutic modality. I think it's something that's very important. As I said earlier, I don't think very many perfusionists even know what this is, much less care what it is. But I, I really think we should because this has real applicability for ECMO patients and this has real applicability for us in the ICU. But 
it is not without its controversy. And there is a lot of controversy with this, all right? There are studies that show there is no benefit one over the other, CRRT versus intermittent dialysis. Studies, some of them, have not detected a difference yet. Now, why is that? Well, there are reasons. I'm going to talk about them. One of them, however, could be we just don't do it right and we don't know how best to do it, which patients may benefit, which ones may not, so specific patients and, and, and conditions. Timing of initiation. We talk about this all the time with ECMO. If you wait too long to put a patient on ECMO, the benefit of that ECMO is gone down and can actually get to zero where it will no longer be of any benefit to put that patient on ECMO. When you have a patient who has acute kidney injury or massive fluid overload and leaning that direction, the longer you wait, the worse everything seems to get. So timing of initiation is hugely important. Technical issues, of course, play a role. Regimens, what's the dose? What's your fluid management? And dose is measured in CRRT with effluent dose, and I'll kind of explain that as we move forward here. Concurrent care also, dosing of antibiotics and nutrition. Remember I told you, you remove not just the inflammatory, the pre, the, 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 the uh, 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 pro-inflammatory mediators, you remove the anti-inflammatory mediators too. So, and also you remove antibiotics and you remove uh, nutrition. So you have to compensate for that as you use this therapeutic modality. Well, if your program looks like this, and I won't go through all of everything, you can read it yourselves, but if your program looks like this, you're not gonna have a CRRT program. And this is not uncommon. And it's a big problem because it makes the therapy look like it is non-beneficial in the studies, and that really matters. When you do it well, the difference is, is, is remarkable. And look, I'll tell you that anecdotally, I realize this is not, you know, I have never done my own randomized control, double-blind study to, to, to explore CRRT, but I've got a pretty good amount of anecdotal experience with this device and with this therapy. And it has saved, I mean, no questions. I have saved patients' lives by being able to offer this as an option for them in hospitals that didn't have it. We can talk more about those, those grand stories. We all love them in our business. You know, it's what makes us want to do what we do when we actually help people. But I've got a lot of stories and, uh, and they're good ones. And, uh, and I've seen it make a huge difference and it has a lot of utility. This basically just essentially represents the same thing that we talked about is if your prescription says you want 25 mLs per kilo per hour removed, but you're only removing 16, then you're really not providing the dose that you expected to, and that patient is not benefiting from it. And that can be for a whole variety of reasons. Generally, they're technical reasons, and it has to do with the, uh, with the access, and we'll talk more about access. But there is a, a paper that was done by Dr. Ronco, who, who really, I think, is considered the, the, the father of modern CRRT. Um, it was published in Lancet, and it was on survival and dosing. And if you look at group one, it's 20 mLs per kilo. If you look at group two, it's 35, and group three was 45. Though not statistically significant, group three did have the highest improvement, but group two definitely did, and that's at about 35 mLs per kilo per hour. And that's how much effluent is being removed. Now, you're replacing it with the replacement fluid, but it's just how they do it with the in the nephrology world, it's very different than us, but the dose is actually your effluent dose. That's what it's measuring. And, but if you need it to be zero balance, then you're going, your replacement is going to be exactly equal to that. If you want to remove fluid from the patient, for example, then what you're going to do is you're going to have a patient fluid removal. So you may be giving back 3,000, but removing 3,200, which means you're taking 200 off for that hour. So your effluent dose is still going to be considered that 3,200, not 3,000. So there are studies, and what it shows us is that there is a break point where, 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 where basically it's dose dependent. So if you look at the, the, the scale, 
you have improvement in survival up to a certain point. And then it really doesn't matter how much you do, how, what, your, what your dose is. You could be 65 mLs per kilo per hour, and it's not going to make any difference. But this area here at this breakpoint tends to be a practice-dependent region. And some people feel it should be here, and some people feel it should be here. But, st but from the data, there's no improvement in survival once you reach some point. The question is, we don't really know what that point is. And I think that's something that's just never been well defined. So keys to success when you do this in the ICU is you want access, 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 access. And then you have the circuit and the filter and the membrane. You have to have those things. Um, you have a blood pump, you have a melt, uh, uh, filter, and you have, a, uh, you have vascular access. If your access is bad, forget it. It's just simply not going to work. Failure is almost always secondary to the filter clotting off, but it's not always due to insufficient anticoagulation. Blood flow and other circuit factors have equal or greater importance. And generally speaking, when you have the catheter bent or kinked or it's stuck up against the wall, these catheters, these, I'm going to talk about dialysis catheters, these temporary dialysis catheters, they're horribly, horribly um, uh, fittic, fickle. That really, you've, you've dealt with it before. I'm assuming you've had that experience in the ICU with the dialysis catheter not working with the ECMO patient. Uh, generally, we're hooking it into our... Our mm -hmm. ECMO circuit. Do so you have much experience either. with the temporary dialysis Not catheters? Really, no. Not too much? Okay. So basically, you know, these are the various ones that are out there. I don't want to spend too much time on these, but they come in different lengths and different configurations. But basically, they have, they're a double lumen tube, um, and uh, they can be anywhere from uh, 13 to 16 French and from 19 centimeters to 50 centimeters. And that's the tunnel. The d temporary is 12.5 to 24, 11.5 to uh, 14 French. And bigger is better. Okay, I'm just going to tell you right now. The bigger is better. All right, fellows? And this is by far the best place to put it. Um, if you put it in the right, right IJ, it is a straight shot, straight down into the uh, right atrium at the SVC RA junction, which is where you really want it to be. Um, that's going to give you the best flow characteristics for this device. If you're using the femoral catheter, you need to use the long one, um, but no one likes putting anything in the groin, okay? I mean, it's got infection problems. You can't bend the patient. They tend to get kinked, um, but, you know, sometimes that's where they put them and they go in there frequently. Um, if here's a formula, you can take a look at this, but uh, if you're going in the right IJ, you take the height divided by 10, 90% of those patients will have the central lumen right where exactly it needs to be. If you're putting it in the left IJ, you need to take the height divided by 10, and that's in centimeters, by the way, plus add four centimeters, 94% of the time, you're going to be in the right spot, right subclavian, left subclavian. So there's a little formula there. You can copy that down, write it down, or whatever you may want to do with that. And then primary factors affecting access. If your access is great or bad, your blood flow rate's going to be affected, your treatment time is going to be affected, and your blood recirculation is going to be affected. In fact, let's talk about blood recirculation. Because sometimes you're in the ICU, you have one of these catheters in, and you are trying to, oh, go ahead and put that, leave, the, uh, leave that image up so we can go over that image. Thanks. But uh, you'll reverse them. You'll make the access blue and the return red. Well, you can easily see what's going to happen. Even with the access red and the return blue, you're going to have some blood come back this way. But if you have to reverse it to keep it running and you're accessing from here and returning here, whoa, it's just going to whoop and switch right back in there like that. So you do it to keep it running. You have to compensate for it. Your recirculation like this is probably bordering on, I would say, 
Uh, if you reverse it and you're accessing blue and returning red, I would say your recirculation, I would reckon to guess, is going to be pretty close to 40%, I would think. Uh, I'm not positive about that, but that's my, my thought. But you'll obviously decrease your clearance and you'll increase the potential for clotting with your uh, CRT circuit. Um, summary of access recommendations, larger is better, right IJ, right IJ, right IJ, even though that says right IJ, left IJ, femorals and subclavian. My view, right IJ, right IJ, right IJ, it gives you the least amount of problems. Use appropriate size catheters and place tips at appropriate locations. These things, these access catheters, temporary dialysis catheters are meant to be buried to the hub. If you leave part of it out, it will have a tendency to kink. And once it kinks, you're done. The catheter is done. You're gonna be putting a wire in there and they're gonna be switching it out. You want it buried to the hub in order for it to last as long as possible. Of course, all of this is solved if you just hook it into the ECMO circuit. But if you are involved in the ICU and you are using this on patients or, or, or you're consulting or whatever it may be, uh, providing the service. We provide the service. We actually provide a CRRT service. I think we do it better than anybody else does. But with that said, if you look at this graph here, essentially what it shows you is the replacement fluid flow to the blood flow and the different patient sizes. And uh, if you uh, look at the blood flow, as the blood flow increases, you can see, you know, that your your replacement fluid rates are going to be are going to be stable are going to decrease but as you slow down you can see how that's going to affect that so you need to have good blood flow in order to achieve the kind of fluid replacement rates that you want if you don't have good blood flow then this is just not going to work so citrate i talked about that I think it's tremendously advantageous. You can put the citrate in the pre-blood pump and run it, and you essentially chelate all the calcium that is going through the CRRT machine. So if you had a patient, for example, who needed this, and I've thought about this with ECMO if there was a way to do it, but I think the flows are just way too high to be able to do it. But it'd be pretty cool if you could, where you could regionally anticoagulate just the ECMO pump, <coughs> yeah, that just was the circuit. possible. That yeah. would be really something, but I think at four or five liters of flow compared to three or 400, two or two, 200 to 400 cc's yeah. of blood flow is vastly different, but it's really good. But you can basically chelate all the calcium and then you have a central line where you replace the calcium in the patient. Um, and it gives you the formula there on how to do it. And uh, it's very helpful. What you can't do is, make the mistake of putting the calcium into the the same dialysis catheter and having it get sucked back yeah. up because then you clot your system off right. or trying to give calcium in a peripheral vein. It's got to be in a central lane, right? We all we all know that. Now, keep in mind, this is not an approved technique, uh, so it's off label, but there's plenty of published protocols for this. They exist all over the place, and uh, it's uh, it's very beneficial, as I said. You know, if you could do that on an ECMO circuit, you could potentially do that on a heart-lung bypass circuit. You could. Which would be scary. Would be incredible, wouldn't it? No, <laughs> it would be, be cool. Incredible. But think about how, think about the benefit of that. To not, oh, sure. Well, but not on the heart-lung machine. ECMO maybe, not really on the heart-lung machine because you have to be concerned about, you know, uh, stat blood that becomes, you know, static. You know, yeah, that's not heart. flowing. Yeah. yeah, in the heart and everything else, in the coronaries. And so I think that'd be problematic to do that. Um, for the pump, even with the ECMO, you know, you've got that big long cannula. Sure, you're 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 decalcifying and anticoagulating the blood pathway, but what would happen? You know, what happens to the outside of those catheters? You know, those are some big tubes, mm -hmm. and those big tubes, you know, they're going to clot on the outside just as well. So I don't know. I don't know that it could be done, but it'd be interesting. It'd be it'd be nice 
because there's patients who are hypersensitive to heparin, of course, and if we could do that and, and, and not anticoagulate those patients, we might not have as many bleeding problems as we do, because bleeding on ECMO is a huge problem, right? Yeah. So anyway, so the advantage, so here's the, here's the formula I was telling you about, and this is how you do it. Make sure that that calcium goes into a central line, not into a peripheral line, because if you infiltrate a peripheral line with calcium going in, we all know that that causes, and it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty, pretty ugly. If you're going to use heparin, this is what we do. Um, for it, we basically run it essentially the same as an ECMO. The, the, the reason why we do that is because the flow is low. So with ECMO, you know, you can get away, you think to yourself, God, ECMO is so much bigger, but you still only run 1.5 times the APTT. Yeah, but you're at four or five liters a minute. This is going sometimes at 200 cc's a minute, and the transit time through the filter is much longer. And it it it, it is look. I mean, you try to you know all these things are somewhat you know are somewhat reduced in thrombogenicity, but everything is everything is 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 thrombogenic. You know, on all these yeah. foreign surfaces, you have to take that into consideration. These are various formulas. I've actually thought about wanting to use some of this for our prime on the pump. And I'll tell you why. If you look at, for example, the, uh, let's look at the BGK425. That's four of, of, of uh, potassium, 2.5 of calcium. And these are bicarb-based solutions. So they have a normal sodium level but they're bicarb-based, which means you don't dilute, because, you know, normosol and plasmolite, and certainly normal saline, but these are acetate-based fluids. So even though normosol and plasmolite are pH-balanced, they have no bicarb. Mm -hmm. You will dilute your bicarb. You give enough fluid, you will become acidotic. So if you're doing, uh, let's say you tried to do CVVH on pump, and you used plasmolite as your replacement fluid, your bicarb level is going to continue to plummet. You're going to have to treat the bicarb. Then you're going to become hypernatremic, and you're going to have to treat the, bi the sodium. So I, these fluids, I, I wonder, well, they're more expensive. That's why we don't use them, okay? For the general case, you really don't need it. But if you've got a really sick patient, or when we do our systemic hyperkalemia, for example, mm -hmm. I use this fluid for those cases. And I use this fluid for those cases because it is bicarb-based. And it's really, really, really nice. I mean, I have to tell you, there's a whole bunch of them out there. This is Prismacate, but Braun has it. Next Stage has theirs. I mean, there's, there's, there's these bicarb-based solutions everywhere. And, you know, they come in five-liter bags. That's one of the other problems is that you only want a one-liter bag. Right. And, uh, but that costs a lot of money for that packaging, and nobody wants to do it. But, you know, the hospital can actually make this, believe it or not. There are sure. hospitals that can make this stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not that hard. Um, the pharmacist wouldn't like me for it very much. They get mad at me and stuff, but nevertheless. Oh, what's up? I can't see it. Chat oh, chat question? Okay, I'll, 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 let me see. You want to go to the chat question? Okay, hold on, everybody. I'm going to go to the chat question. Hold on. Let's see. We have a chat question. Sir, I have used calcium while on ECMO with a CRT machine. Okay, how do you deal with pressure? Okay, let's see. Uh, we see it, Joe. Okay. How do you deal with pressures when hooking up to ECMO? Our line pressure kept the lay. Yes, absolutely. I have used calcium while on ECMO with CRT machine using citrate. Well, if you're on ECMO, you don't need citrate. So I wouldn't have done that, Sarah, but I'm going to get to these questions. Let me, uh, let me, I'm almost done actually with the talk. And then if we can, if you guys don't mind, it would be so appreciated um, to let me uh, maybe use the little boys' room and then to come back. So we'll take a quick break after I finish the talk, and I'll address these questions because they're really, really good questions. And, and that way you get a cup, okay? So Because you want that cup. That cup's really important. I want okay. a cup. <laughs> you can't have one. You're, you're, okay, you're disqualified. You're part of faculty. <laughs> Faculty's excluded. Okay, so let's see. I got to go here, go here. Okay, look, it was my last slide. The key about all of this fluid balance and management is that it's all about making everything that goes in come out at the end of the day. We don't want our patients to be fluid overloaded. You saw that picture of that lady. Um, she was probably a good 30 liters. 
That's 30 liters fluid yeah. overload. I don't think people really understand how much fluid you can hold, you know, not intravascularly, you're yeah. gonna blow up, okay? The yeah. heart's gonna just die. Yeah. But total body, how much fluid you can actually overload somebody. And if you've ever, and I wish I had the picture, you know, I hate it because my computer got stolen. You knew that, okay? I knew that. I probably that, shouldn't yeah. have brought that and up to you. Two years. Soon. Probably somewhat sensitive about that still. But my computer <laughs> got stolen. I had a great picture on it of a patient that looked just like that lady that we had reopened the chest and you could see the heart. And we ultra filtrated that lady in the, in the operating room, took off somewhere around 12 liters over the course of six hours. And her heart looked so much better. She looked so much better and was doing so much better. But then you get into the argument of albumin and not albumin. Should you use it? I, people are so recalcitrant, not wanting to use albumin. I'm a big believer in it. Unless you have a, if you have a true capillary leak, then albumin would be the worst thing in the world to give somebody. I, I, I recognize that. But not every patient has a capillary leak. And it really makes a difference in terms of increasing the speed in which you can pull fluid from the interstitium back into the vascular space to be removed. But anyway, with that said, listen, I've, I've finished the presentation part. Um, I want to get to these questions. I'm going to ask if we could just take a quick commercial break and then I will come back and talk with you about this and also answer some of these questions because I think they're great questions. All right. Okay. So if we could do that, thank you very much. We'll take a quick commercial break. Imagine trying to drive a car looking only through the rear view mirror. Critical decisions would be based on old and possibly inaccurate information. The same can be true of performing cardiopulmonary bypass without continuous inline blood gas monitoring. Terumo's CDI Blood Parameter Monitoring System 500 continuously delivers 11 critical blood parameters throughout the procedure. With other systems, Periodic blood gas measurements provide static information that is helpful but limited. Continuous monitoring tells you what you need to know every step of the way, and that reduces risk. Studies show a direct correlation between blood gas management and reduced complication rates. The CDI System 500 has been earning the trust of cardiac hospitals and cardiovascular surgical teams for almost 20 years. It provides continuous monitoring of 11 of the most critical blood gas parameters, utilizing industry-leading technology. During cardiopulmonary bypass surgery, the shunt sensor can be placed in any arterial or venous shunt or purge line with continuous flow. The shunt sensor uses optical fluorescence technology to measure PO2, PCO2, pH, and potassium in the blood. Four microsensors and a thermistor well are in direct contact with the blood to accurately and rapidly measure the values. Light emitting diodes direct light pulses toward the microsensors, which contain fluorescent dyes. 
The intensity of the fluorescent light from the microsensors will vary depending on the levels of PO2, PCO2, pH, and potassium in the blood. The photodetector measures and converts the light to numerical data, which is then displayed on the monitor. Blood values are always current with virtually no gaps. There is no need to make difficult judgments about when to draw a sample. Gas source or oxygenator failure can be rapidly detected. Continuous monitoring is especially beneficial during procedures on young or old patients or with smaller perfusion circuits. Peer-reviewed clinical evidence supports the value of continuous blood gas monitoring. Contact your Terumo sales representative for a demonstration or visit terumo-cvs.com. Okay, and welcome back to the program. Patrick, thank you very much for joining me this evening. Sure. I appreciate you so very much. Um, so we've got a couple of uh, interesting questions, and you had said to her the break that you wanted Timothy's question. Timothy, what is coming and when? So, Patrick, if you want to address that one, that'd be great. And I got a text well, I, from somebody. I think somebody the future in general uh, is pretty bright. So, <laughs> okay. There may be right, some Timothy, political issues coming. Timothy, we're not sure what you mean by that. And then, <laughs> and then Rebecca says, we see it, Joe. So that must have been my mouse that I was, I was moving around, I believe. Um, and someone also mentioned to me that I needed to, I looked a little draggy and that I needed to perk it up some. So I'm going to try to do that for you all, too. Um, how do you deal with pressures when hooking up to the ECMO? Our line pressures kept alarming the dialysis machine. Absolutely. Yep. And I'm going to tell you right now, you absolutely cannot. I don't care. I mean, you, you, okay. I won't say absolutely can't, but I'm going to say pretty close to absolutely cannot hook a traditional standard dialysis machine into an ECMO pump. They want you to, or ECMO circuit, they ask us to do it. You remember we, uh, yeah. I won't say the name of the hospital, but we, they tried that how many times? Yeah, it, it won't work. It, it will just, alarm over and over. It just will not work. The environment, the pressure environment of the ECMO circuit is just too hostile. You have to remember, think about it. A dialysis machine is designed, and even these CRT machines are designed, for a central venous pressure. They're not designed for being in an ECMO circuit, so which is, you know, you have pressures of negative, you know, 150 on the venous side and positive 240 on the, on the arterial side. So 
the pressures are enormous and it's just, it can't handle it. So I would absolutely not true. Andrew from St. John's. Andrew, how are you, man? Uh, you were at the New Orleans conference. It's good to see you again. Um, but uh, uh, I would absolutely just not try to do it, um, which means they're going to have to stick the patient. And if they stick the patient and mess up, now you got a hole in a vessel that, you know, potentially is going to create a lot of problems for you because you're going to be anticoagulated. And especially if you hit the artery or something. And how you going to stick it in the neck and you accidentally hit the carotid. Now you got huge problems. You know, and it happens. You know, you don't want it to happen. You use ultrasound. It shouldn't happen, but it does. So even this, a needle stick in a carotid when you're on ECMO can be a real problem. Um, I would recommend, Andrew, my suggestion is don't try hooking dialysis up to it. Try hooking instead the um, uh, getting a CRRT machine. The next stage will work. You have to put a stopcock sometimes and sort of turn the stopcock a little bit. And if you do that, it won't see as <coughs> much pressure um, and it, 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 it'll stop alarming. The Prismaflex machine from Baxter Gambro, you know, look, I think all these companies are basically the same. I don't like any of them, frankly. I, 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 I love the technology and I, I can't stand the damn companies. But, uh, but regardless, I think that at this point, it's the best widget out there. I know that uh, B. Braun used to have a machine, um, and that machine, uh, they took it off the market for whatever reason. I know that uh, they have a new machine in Europe they're working on, but these companies, they're suing each other all the time. It's constantly a problem, and uh, you know the benefit to the patients and the advancement of technology is always stymied by these companies uh, suing each other over one thing or another. And so hopefully we'll get more technology out there to, to use. But I, uh, at the end of the day, I think that uh, 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 the, the Prismaflex machine is, is probably the, the, the best widget to use for our purposes at this point in time. And then the, I'll just quickly deal with this. Uh, our solution was to use ECMO circuit to hemoconcentrator return to pre-existing SLIC and IG. Uh, our solution was to use ECMO circuit to hemoconcentrator, right? Return to pre-existing SLIC in IJ. I'm not sure I know what that is. SLIC in IJ. Unless he means IJ, not IG. Um, Andrew, I can't quite figure that one out, man. Ask me that one again. So getting on to the uh, Sarah's question, though, about the sit sheath in the IJ. Gotcha. Okay, must be, uh, must have been, uh, yeah, you could do that. You know, you can do that, um, and it works, but, of course, you're, you're, you're going to then be dependent upon, you know, using a clamp to remove fluid and then clamp it or, or putting a, one of those little screw clamps on it and trying to adjust it. It's, it works. I mean, I think you did the right thing because it worked. You needed it. Um, but it's a very imprecise way of doing it. And this is, hell, it's 2018. You know, we shouldn't be doing things like we did in the 1960s. You know, I think we need to, yeah, I think you would, I would, I would, uh, yep, it's finicky. Yeah, I would, I would do that. Getting to Sarah's question, though, on the citrate, um, Using calcium while on ECMO with a CRRT machine. I mean, if you're on heparin and you're anticoagulated, okay. Um, hey, can we just take one quick, one quick, one quick break? One quick break, just real quick for a second. Can we go offline for one second? Everybody, hold on one second. Oh, we got a call. Can we just go offline for one second, please? Don't play an ad or anything. Just the logo. Hey, hey, this is Joe Bosch. You're on the air. Hey, Roger, can we just pick one camera? I can't do it back and forth. Okay. Hey, you're on the air. Hey, Joe, we can go back live again. It's Sarah. Hey, Sarah. Do you want to wait until we're back on? I don't, I don't know. No, we're, we're back on now. Okay, great. Um, so I meant to say citrate. I did not mean to say calcium. Ah, okay. Um, but, you were, <laughs> but you were heparinized, right? Uh, we, were, we were not heparinized. Oh. So, you were... um, so what happened was um, this patient was on ECMO for about um, 
30 days already. Uh-huh. And we were having issues with um, bleeding in certain areas. And yeah. um, especially you could see it coming out of the um, intubation tube and things like that. So we knew that um, it was affecting his lungs. Yeah. So um, they did chest x-rays um, at least once a day, and they determined that the heparin was causing him issues with that. So they wanted to come up with something else um, in order to still use the CRRT machine and ECMO, but still be anticoagulated. Mm -hmm. So um, from the CRRT machine was running off of our ECMO circuit, mm -hmm. um, and what we did was is we put um, a citrate infusion mm -hmm. pre-CRRT machine. Mm -hmm. Right. And then it went through, then the blood flow went through the CRRT machine. And I think I remember correctly that we put calcium back on the other side before it went back to the patient in order to maintain um, proper calcium concentration. Yeah. Well, you can, and we didn't have any issues with clotting after that. Yeah, you could probably do that because you were going into your ECMO circuit. In other words, you probably, you had, right. you had, you didn't have recirculation like you would if you were just doing um, it through a, through an inter, or through an intermittent dialysis filter or, or oh, okay. a, a catheter. So if you're just using an intermittent dialysis catheter, and you're returning it into that same catheter and 30%, 20 to 30% of that is getting recirculated back, then you're adding calcium back to the blood as it's coming right. back and that's gonna create problems for you. But if you're going from your return into an ECMO circuit with a whole bunch more volume and no, recir no, no recirculation and you're adding the citrate where you were, I can see where that would have worked. What I find what I find interesting is that, you know, and I know the flow is much lower. So you're telling me that before they started using the citrate, the CRRT was clotting off? Yes, it had clotted off. Um, I did a 12 hour shift and it clotted off twice in Ooh. just my shift alone. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So that's we a... were really having trouble with it. So we knew we had to do something. And so this was the first solution we came up with. Well, I think it was a great solution. I mean, I'm not sure how Thanks. the, I'm not sure how the procedure, the case ended up, but I got to tell you, I mean, I think, uh, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, right? Yeah. So how much, uh, of course. how much, uh, citrate and how much calcium, what was your, your ratio there? Gosh, I can't remember. Um, I can find out if you guys want me to, and I can I can email you or something. Um, but um, I can definitely get that information for you. But the guy, um, he was on ECMO even after we did that change. He was probably on ECMO for another month. Wow. And um, I was just there last week, and he is um, walking around. Wow. That's amazing. Now, that is yeah. amazing. That that it is, was amazing. That is amazing. you mind if I ask how old the patient was? Um, I believe he was in his 60s. 60s. And he was... Uh, <laughs> he was a younger guy, and he um, presented to the ER with, um, like, a really bad cold symptom. Wow. Yeah. It was so, very weird. <laughs> what, did he, what did he end up... Ha I mean, what was his diagnosis besides ARDS? Um, his diagnosis was... I think it was one of those things where it was kind of like a mystery. That's why he was there for so long. Wow. Is that... Um, I know that... Um, some, some pulmonary issue because it, his lungs were the main issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They were completely whited out for, for weeks. So he had a normal, he had a nor he had normal cardiac function. Yes. So do you, do you mind describing to us what your, what your ECMO circuit cannulation uh, setup was and which, which, what circuits you used? Um, we use the cardio health. Okay. Um, and it was, we used the Avalon cannula, uh -huh. so, um, which I think is pretty cool um, because it's just one cannulation site with flow going in and out. Right. Um, We're going to be talking about that I on think, Thursday. Yeah, it was, it's pretty cool. That, that's pretty much all they use at the hospital that I do ECMO at. Uh-huh. Is the Avalon and um, cardio help. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So let me ask you this now. For the cardio help, my understanding is you are not supposed to 
cut anything into it to add anything like you did with the CRRT circuit. So was there any discussion about that or was it just, well, this is what we have to do and this is just what we're going to do? It's actually um, at the hospital that I do um, ECMO shifts at, they pretty much have at least one ECMO patient on at all times. Um, uh -huh. they, they have a high volume of ECMO patients. And I'm, they have a um, protocol um, for CRRT machines with ECMO. So I don't know if they met with the cardio help reps and developed something or what, but when we set up our ECMO circuit um, before initiating ECMO, we already have stopcocks in place. Uh -huh. Even if we don't use CRRT every time, mm -hmm. there are stopcocks in place for when we do want to add it on. Yeah, so that's a modification from what the, the, the system is actually supposed to, to look like. It must be. Yeah, and yeah, you know what? You I, know, I haven't seen it without it, so that's all I know. And let, let me show you this. Hey, Austin, could you do me a favor? Could you run back into my office and there's that catheter? That, grab that catheter. Let me show you something. I've got some, because on Thursday, we're actually going to be talking about ECMO and um, uh, all the different various... ECMO cannulation techniques that you can use, um, you know, and, and, and uh, VA, VV, you know, what, yeah, that thing. Here, take a look at this. So I've got, and I've got this catheter. So this probably, you know, reminds you of it. So this is what you're talking about. <laughs> oh, it's an Avalon. Yeah, so, yeah, it's an Avalon. <laughs> okay, just let's see if you can see it. Yep, there she yeah. is. <laughs> yeah, there it is right there. Yeah. Yep, there it is. Yeah, here, I gotta get my. It's awesome. You like that cannula. If it's they're in the right tough, place, though. it's awesome. Any issue. <laughs> yeah, they're tough, yeah. though. They're tough. This, this is a 31. I got to tell you, that's a, I don't know that I want that that's thing a big stuck one. in me. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't know that I want that thing stuck in my neck. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, hey, look, the guy survived. <laughs> um, but it, it is yeah, a, he, it is, all do. It is a little fickle, you know, but I do think it's so much better than the dual cannulation that we use. And it keeps oh, it out sure. of the. Like for infection and things like that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, having the, having having femoral cannulation is horrible. We still do it, and we still yeah. we still do it. We're still seeing it. You know, we put one in the femoral vein and one in the right IJ. We try to use this more, but even with uh, with VA ECMO, of course, you know, you're going to be down there, and it really really compromises what you can do with the patient, whether you can sit them up and, you know, all, turn, yeah. all that kind of stuff in the neck. And I, I hope you join us on, on Thursday because one of the questions that I have, and Chris Loosby is going to join us on Thursday as well from Memorial. And they have, they're like you, they have ECMO going all the time. And, uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, so there's always at least two or three patients on ECMO down at the med center. And, uh, but you know, I've, talk to people who are saying that they're taking ECMO patients and waking them up um, and extubating them on VV ECMO. And, I, you know, I'm like, wait a minute. I mean, you might be doing that with a lung transplant patient, but I don't know. I mean, do you think that your patient that you just got through discussing at day 10 could have been, you know, on VV, VV ECMO could have been extubated? Or, I mean, I think these people are just too sick. I um. For, for this patient specifically, no. But of course, you know, it depends on the patient. It depends on the situation. Mm -hmm. But this patient, absolutely not. Do, do you do that, though? Do you wake patients up on ECMO? I know we're not talking about CRT well, now, I, but we're talking about ECMO. When with, she's with done answering this question, I've got a story. It's pretty good. Yeah. So do you have patients that you wake up like that? We have. Um, there's actually a patient that I walked in um, to start my shift. He was awake. He was a younger guy. He was probably in his, um, probably in his 30s. And the nurse went up to him and said, you know, are you, are you in any pain? And he, um, he, can, he could move his hand to do a thumbs up or thumbs down. And he did, um, like, thumbs up, like he was good. He wasn't in any pain or anything. It, uh -huh. was, it, was, uh, it was pretty wild. But, um, but he was awake. But they, um, but still... Pretty sedated, though. You know, they yeah. they make sure that they're not uncomfortable. But did you take um, the tube out? Did you extubate the patient? Um, the patient was not extubated. No. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, I'm hearing people are extubating these patients. Yeah. One, so one, one time years ago, here. I worked in uh, in Las Vegas, and we had a patient that was going to be transferred for a transplant for a lung transplant, 
and he was on Vino Venus ECMO. Uh, he was extubated, and uh, they knew he was going to be on ECMO for a good six weeks at least, so they got him up and walked him around the unit on a walker. And that oh was something. <laughs> to see, seven people like holding lines and making sure, because if he fell, he would have decannulated. Well, I, it's the only time I've ever seen anything like that, and that was about 20 years ago. That's unbelievable. You think I'm making this up, but it's, not, it's true. <laughs> and the patient did okay? I don't know what happened to him. I mean, he was transferred out for a transplant eventually, so I don't, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, but again, wow. that's a lung transplant yeah. patient. Yeah. I think there's a big, and I think this is the issue. And of course, again, we're not on the seat. We're, 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 we're off topic. We'll, we'll get there on Thursday. But whatever. <laughs> we'll get there on Thursday. But I think there's a, an enormous difference between a patient who is uh, infected and their white counts are grossly elevated and they're in, they're acutely ill versus someone who is um, chronically has pulmonary uh, insufficiency, is on a lung transplant list, is otherwise okay. They're not infected. They're mm -hmm. not septic. They're not sick. I don't know. I, I, I can tell you, if I, was, if, I was, if I was on ECMO for like this guy you were talking about, Sarah, that, that, that uh, you guys did, I, don't wake me up. Don't wait, do not wake yeah. me up. In fact, I'm going to tattoo that on my chest. Do not wake me up on ECMO. Just leave me alone. Let me get better and then take me off of the thing. But, uh, but anyway, so yeah. that's, that's it. So back to the CRRT, though, sort of getting back on topic here for a little while. Um, you know, I, I have these cases. I got called to a hospital. It was in uh, a small town in Louisiana. And uh, um, at the time, my wife was actually working at this hospital. And uh, she uh, called, she talked to the medical director who had this patient in the ICU and uh, they had had um, a gangrenous leg and they had kind of whittled at it, but uh, didn't, I guess, get it all. And um, they didn't cut, they, they did a BKA where they really needed to do an AKA. And uh, anyway, this lady was really sick. I mean, her pH was 7.06. Um, she was, uh, I mean, just, just massively fluid overloaded. I mean, 30, 30 plus liters. She was, I mean, this lady was dying and, uh, I didn't have a CRT machine. So I took two roller pumps from a closet and I just basically just made one with a hemoconcentrator and I sat there all night long treating her with this and got her to where she was relatively normal. And then um, we, uh, and, and, and just to make sure we fully, dis fully disclose, the, 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 the hospital had requested nephrology support from the local group in town, but they didn't have, they normally did not provide dialysis services at this hospital. It was a state hospital, of course, you know how that goes. And, uh, and they said, no, they couldn't come transfer the patient to one of the other hospitals where we go. And um, the hospital attempted to get the lady transferred. And of course she had, she was on resource, she had no money. So none of the hospitals would take her. So all that was gonna happen was she was going to just die. And so um, I did this all night long and parted to the next day. And then I was just exhausted. I mean, I needed to get some sleep and I needed to work too. I, mean, I had a regular job. And uh, uh, so I, I went back the next day and she was, she had gotten better, but then got sick again. And I did it again and I did it again and I did it again for like five days. And that lady walked, they finally did the AKA and that lady walked out of the hospital. She huh. walked, well, she didn't walk, she got rolled out and she was a little bit ticked off that she lost her leg. I was kind of like taken aback by that. Okay, so she hopped out of the the hospital okay she didn't actually walk but she survived the whole damn thing and i mean those are that's just one story of several stories that i have that are anecdotal in regards to how this therapeutic modality can really benefit patients i think it's hugely i think it's abused at times i think it's misused at times but i think that it has tremendous potential when used properly to be beneficial the long and the short of the story, though, Sarah, if you're still on the line and, and Patrick sitting here, here or anybody else that may be out there, is the nephrology group in the town was so mad at me for having done this 
that they reported me to the state board and yeah. charged me with practicing nephrology without a license. And, uh, and by the time, you know, of course, I was working under the medical director of the hospital. So I was like, what the hell are you talking about? I'm just a technician doing the, I'm doing the, the, the mechanical part. Anyway, by the time it got all the way down to them and I went down there and explained to them what happened, they were so appalled that the nephrologist wouldn't go take care of them, that they got their own investigation on them. I was like, that's what that's poet, that's justice there. Finally, something goes my way. You know, I got a pat on the back and they got their own investigation for refusing to take care of the patient because they were supposed to, you know, but they didn't want to because the patient didn't have any money. That's ridiculous. Uh, where did you cannulate for that? How'd that work? Uh, put them a Herker catheter and ephemeral. Okay. Yeah, just put ephemeral vein, you know, Herker catheter and ephemeral vein. And it worked, but uh, you know it was it was not the time to try to be uh, be be too 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 you know complaining. Can you put an IJ in? Just put the damn just put it in the yeah. femoral, whatever they're comfortable with. And again, it was a state hospital with very few resources. I mean, you know, not even the idea of having a CRT machine. I ended up buying CRT machines, and that hospital eventually, although it eventually closed down because the the then governor of Louisiana had had a mission to close the charity hospital system down, which is sad because that was a staple of what was Louisiana. I mean, more training got done at charity hospitals. You saw if you could see it, if there was a if there was a disease or an injury that you could see as a physician or a clinician or a perfusionist or whatever the heck you were, a charity hospital is where you needed to go because you saw it all. And, uh, but they eventually shut those down. But they eventually did get, uh, that's how my CRRT machine service that I have actually began, was at that hospital. And they uh, leased the machines from me and I provided support and the nurses ran it. I teach, taught them how to do it. And they did a fantastic job, you know, and it worked really well and it was very beneficial to a lot of patients. So I, I think therapy is incredibly useful. It's slow, it's precise. Um, you're replacing things, you're using convective clearance. In terms of managing fluid balance, in terms of managing electrolyte derangements, in terms of managing acid base, I don't think there's anything that works as well. Now we do ultrafiltration on pump all the time. And that's, we do that almost exclusively for fluid balance removal. But should we be considering using this more? Should we be doing some form of CVVH? If it removes those pro-inflammatory mediators, as soon as they do a sternotomy, we have some level of SIRS occurs. Should this become something we do routinely? I'd love to see it get studied, but you know, I don't, I don't do studies. So, you know, somebody else would have to take that up and, and decide to do it. Sarah, I think you ought to do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you get started on that tomorrow, write the protocol, it'd be fantastic. Yes, I will consider for sure doing that. <laughs> All righty. Well, that's good. Well, do you have any other, you have any other questions, Sarah, or anything else you'd like to contribute? Um, I think that's it for the CRRT. Say that again? I think that's all I have for the CRRT. Okay. Well, good. Well, what'd you think of the program? I thought it was good. I thought um, it covered a few things um, that I didn't really know the details of um, mm -hmm. because we don't necessarily run the CRRT machine in the ICU. Uh -huh. The nurses do, and then we run the ECMO machine. But when it's connected to our ECMO circuit, I think it's important to know all the details. So I really appreciate you going into depth about everything. Sure, and I'll tell you this too. In fact, I'm gonna type it in the comments. There's a akinet.org is one, and the other one is, um, what is the name of that? Hold on, I'm, let, me, let me look this up. I think it's crrt.com. I don't think that's what it is. I don't think it's crrt.com. Um, let me see. No, that's not it. Google, let me go to, let me go to the Google. Um, CRRT online. Maybe that's what it is. CRRTonline.com. CR yeah, that's it. CRRT online. Let me write, let me, let me put that on here. So there's two websites. One is akinet.org and the other one is crrtonline.com. Both of these websites 
are excellent resources for anybody that really wants to understand CRRT. And there's several people, like I've mentioned Ronco's study, but there's a, a, a the Australian group is huge in this. There's a, a Dr. Belomo out there. He's done a tremendous amount of work on CRRT and its utility with certain patient populations. And also um, there's a, a Dr. Kellum up at uh, University of Pittsburgh um, UPenn, he's real big, he's an intensivist up there, and there's a Dr. Luis Juncos at University of Mississippi in Jackson, he came from the Mayo Clinic actually before that, and he's done a tremendous amount of work on, uh, on CRRT. And I think these, you know, there, there's a lot, there's so much information out there, so much data out there. I really suggest we as clinicians look at it more as perfusionists because I think that it, 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 there's, it's a tool in a tool chest that we can suggest and or implement for our really critically ill ECMO patients, for example, and maybe even translating this into the operating room. Maybe we need to consider insisting that we change our our priming fluids, and maybe that would make some difference or whatever it may be. I, I, I think that it's a, again, I think it's a, a tool normally not found in our toolbox, but somebody else's toolbox that I think would be uh, very beneficial for us as, as, a, as a, a part of the heart care team to be, to be more knowledgeable of. I think we've, we could do a lot better job with that. So if you're a, a perfusionist, let's say you have three perfusionists in your program, and you know you don't have CRRT or access to it. What what would be some of the big hurdles that you would expect to run into? What's the maybe the cost of the machines, or in your experience, just what? How that's would a they great start, question. You know? That's a great question. Okay, so one of the things that's hugely problematic for CRRT is that it's expensive. Yeah. Okay. Um, but dialysis isn't cheap. Okay, the cost of dialysis is not in the cost of the disposables and the solution that's used, the dialysate. The cost is in the nurse, the dialysis nurse, that has to sit there and run it for four hours or so. That's where the real cost is, two hours, four hours, six hours, whatever mm -hmm. it ends up being. It's, a, it's, a, it's an extended dialysis. CRRT, the cost of the disposables and the fluids are more expensive, but the nurse at the bedside technically is able to oper operate it. So you take that person, that nurse, out of the equation. In terms of overall cost to the patient's hospital stay, it's really not that expensive if done properly. But if you do anything improperly or poor patient selection or bad access and you just don't do it well, you don't do it the way it's intended to be used and do it well, the cost is going to be higher. So, and it's not going to benefit the patient. You want it to benefit the patient. I wanted to get back to a point that I made about the studies not detecting a difference. Let me tell you what's so hard about doing a study on CRRT. And I can't remember the name of the study. It might have been a renal trial. I'm not sure which one it was. But, um, and you'll have to forgive me for that. But the patients were randomized. So if you went, if you met the criteria of acute renal failure, you got randomized into the CRT group or you got randomized into the intermittent dialysis group. If you were hemodynamically unstable, in other words, they put you on dialysis and you crumped, you were taken off of dialysis, put on CRRT, and then transitioned back to dialysis, and you were considered as part of the dialysis arm. Now, how does that, that make, make any, any sense? sense. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're, a, if you're a patient, not a, 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 like pick, Sarah, pick the name of a heart surgeon. You pick the name of any heart surgeon you want. And your patient- Dr. Robinson. There, Dr. Robinson, okay. And, and, and <laughs> we're gonna have Patrick pick Dr. Matoyer. If you go into the ICU and you're doing a study and Dr. Robinson and Dr. Matoyer's patients are both hemodynamically unstable and need to be dialyzed, 
and you tell them, hey, great news, doc, your patient's going to get in the study, but they've been randomized to intermittent dialysis. Knowing what we know about intermittent dialysis in terms of its increased risk of hemodynamic instability and what we know about CRRT, which because it's slower and continuous, it's less, it's less harsh and you don't have that hemodynamic, it actually stabilizes hemodynamics. What, what's Dr. Robinson and Dr. Matoyer going to tell you? Sure, well, go CRRT, ahead. right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, you're randomized to, 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 to intermittent dialysis. No, you're not going to do that to my patient. Put them on the CRRT. So, you know, it, don't go crazy. You're going to put them on intermittent dialysis and, and, and potentially make them arrest. Yeah. There's no way that's going to happen. So doing these studies is very, very, very hard. And it reminds me of a comment that was made. And I, again, somebody else uh, taught me this, and I need to make sure that I... I've got to remember who tells me these sayings, because it's a great saying. And it's reg it was regarding CRRT. And somebody said, well, there's no evidence to support that it increases or improves survival in this group of patients with acute renal failure. Well, his response to that was absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So just because a study hasn't shown it to be doesn't mean that it isn't. Yeah. It's never been shown not to be. It just hasn't been shown to be. And I think the reason for that is designing the studies to actually prove one way or the other is nearly impossible to do. That's what I think. Sarah, you agree with me? I, yes. 100%. Okay, you get two cups. Sarah, you get two. And I get no cups. You get two cups. You get Patrick's cup. All right. Well, I think, um, I think we've had a lively discussion. I think it's been a good, a good, uh, a good program. I, Are we done already? I think so. Oh, well, okay. Do you have something to add? Well, you, I want to. Uh, well, come on. Yeah. Go. Could you talk about the differences of citrate and heparin? I mean, I know you kind of touched on that a little bit, but just, okay, just so go over that just in, in a nutshell. Okay, between citrate and heparin yeah. are. I mean, it, I know the differences of the drugs. Sure. But you know what I mean? Yeah, I know. So if you give heparin, I know what you're, what you're asking mm -hmm. me. If you give heparin, you're giving it systemically. Sure. Okay. And uh, you can reverse it, but you basically are going to anticoagulate the patient. And that's going to help your CRRT machine not clot because it's thrombogenic. If you give citrate, the citrate goes into the access line, right. decalcifies the blood, yep. gets returned to the patient simultaneously to calcium going into the patient at the rate previously shown and prescribed so that you keep your ionized calcium levels of the patient yeah. normal. So the patient's calcium level never changes. Yeah. And that's off label? Yeah, it's off label. Wow. Not FDA. Well, I've seen it done. Yeah. It's off label. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Seen it done. But that's the, that's the difference. Mm -hmm. And you do have to be concerned a little bit in that I think the citrate can cause, you've got to be, you've got to be careful. You got to know what you're doing. If you end up not giving the calcium back, well, then your patient's going to corrupt because they're going to become right. grossly hypocalcemic. That's a problem. I told you that you can't not give it where it'll recirc back to the machine, except in the case with Sarah's, which was unique and different, and it worked in that particular circumstance. Um, and you darn sure don't want to give it in a peripheral line and have it infiltrate because they're going to lose an arm. Um, so there's some problems with it. It's, it's, it's not nearly as easy as heparin, but if you have a patient who needs, who is a acute, acute renal failure and they need to uh, be on dialysis to survive um, and they're uh, a HITS patient, they're, they have a heparin, an heparin antibody and you can't give them heparin, I guess you could give them argatroban, but I, I think that regionally anticoagulating the CRT circuit to me makes way more sense. Yeah, okay. Or they're bleeding. Let's say you have a bleeding right. patient. Let's not use a HITS patient. Let's use a patient who is bleeding, has surgical bleeding, and you don't want to anticoagulate the patient. So even argatroban would be, would be a horrible idea. Regional anticoagulation to the system without any systemic effect makes a lot of sense. Now, they will get a little more alkalotic, uh, metabolically alkalotic, but you can treat that, so that's not too hard. You can change one of the bags on the machine from uh, the prismacate solution or, or brawn, whatever solution it is you're using, I say prismacate, but whatever bicarb-based solution, and you can add one uh, bag of saline, for example, normal saline, which will dilute that bicarb down. So you can correct it fairly easily. It's not that hard to do. And that's the thing about these machines is you can change the fluids and mix and match them to accomplish 
what you want the plasma water to look like. It's really pretty cool. I mean, I think, like I said, I'd use the resources. There's no way I can tell you everything there is to know about CRT in this short of a program. It's a really, it's a really neat, um, but somewhat complex. It's simple and complex. It's kind of a dichotomy. It just seems like so simple, but there's a lot of nuance to it. Um, that you have to learn. And I think, again, you know, not to belabor the message or to, to, to pound my point, you know, into the, with a hammer, I think perfusionists need to be more engaged with these kinds of odd modalities we normally don't get involved in, not necessarily because we should be absorbing them or taking them over, but because we need to think out, it's basically thinking outside of your box. And the other guy's tool chest may have a tool in it that just might work for us, but we're so siloed, we only look in our own toolbox. We need to start thinking about other people's toolboxes. Even in dissimilar industries, this is similar, but dissimilar industries as well. It's the whole concept of that pumps and pipes thing that I think is, I mean, Sarah, if anybody watching, that pumps and pipes conference is incredible. It blends cardiovascular medicine, um, uh, aerospace, and the uh, oil and gas industry together. And that's why it's called Heard Pumps and Pipes. Yeah. And it's an incredible, but the, the uh, conference with some neat people and, and stuff you'll never hear anywhere else. And that's their whole theme is the other guy's tool chest. You have three dissimilar industries and yet so much of what each of them do actually cross over to it into each other. And they've all been able to learn from each other. And I think that that's what we need to do too work more with nephrology, even though some nephrologists are 100% opposed to CRRT, others embrace it, some intensivists really believe in it, some do not. Um, cardiovascular surgeons should be the ones ordering it on their patients when they're unstable and they have, they start becoming, you know, oliguric and, or they're, they're even just their urine up, it's going down and they see a problem is starting to occur ordering it, demanding that they have it, because it's so much better for our patients than waiting until we have to do intermittent dialysis. Yeah. And I, ECMO patients, I think every ECMO yeah. patient should have CRT hooked up to them, period. Now, Chris Lusby disagrees with me on that. We're going to discuss that on Thursday as well. So, Sarah, I might need your backup. Chris, Chris Lusby, who's going to be sitting over here in this chair on Thursday, he completely disagrees with me that CRRT should be used on ECMO patients. I'm not sure why. I'm going to wait to see what he has to say and his reason for it, but I completely disagree with him. So that should be a real lively debate between him and I as well. Did you have any other questions? Uh, I would like to plug a show coming up on the 4th. Sure, plug I your show. I have to do this because plug your show. we're going to do something that has never been done before. And it may sound very basic, but on October 4th, I know it's a ways off and it'll be on the website and all. Um, as a perfusionist, you know, if somebody else is running the pump, you can go and look at the heart and you can see what's happening there during the surgery. Or if you're running the pump, you can see what's happening with the pump and you can look up at the vitals and you can, you know, see what effect you have on that. But you can't see all three at once. There's no way to do it at all. So what we're doing, and we've been working on this for probably uh, four months, I would say, getting footage. We've got a, a, a camera trained on the uh, reservoir and on the pump head. And we've got a camera trained on each of the pump heads, the, uh, the suckers and the, uh, the vents and the uh, LV vent, if we're using that. A camera on the heart and also a live feed from the vitals. So every single, and all of this is, is streamed into one box, which is then we can show this in boxes on the screen. We're going to have this video, which we'll have edited down to, we don't know how long the video will be. But um, you'll be able to see exactly what happens when the perfusionist makes a change on the circuit or when the surgeon make a makes a change up on the field. And I think there's going to be a lot to be learned both from surgeons and from perfusionists. Um, we're going to have a couple of surgeons here, at least one, maybe two, who were part of the filming. So they'll be here to make comments. Maybe some of them will learn that when they tell us to turn the... Uh, the sump up that it doesn't really make any difference in the blood in the coronaries and you'll be able to see that so we'll see and yeah, maybe, maybe gonna, we'll learn something too that is going to be that is going to be <laughs> a really 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 good program and i think what the surgeons are really that are going to come and participate and even those watching it are going to learn that just because they told us to do something and because we said we were going to that we may not actually do it. Oh, I and hope they don't see that. that's something that's good, too. <laughs> All right. So they say float out. Yeah, 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 float out. 
yeah, yeah. <laughs> They'll see that too. So, uh, all right. Well, listen, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I think, call it early. I think we've had a great discussion. Sarah, thank you so much for contributing the way you did. And uh, do you like the studio, by the way? I love it. It's beautiful. You do? You like it? And why don't you come down? Where are you? I'm in Michigan. <laughs> Michigan. Oh, do you know, do you know Stephanie and Rodell? Uh, no. No. What part of Michigan are you in? Uh, I'm just outside of Detroit. It's called Dearborn. Yeah, I know where Dearborn, yeah. Michigan is. We all know where Dearborn, yeah. Michigan Stephanie is. Stephanie Rodella from Dear, uh, well, from Detroit. So yeah, uh, Stephanie. The area. Stephanie from Detroit. Yeah, Rodell Ebus and Stephanie. Uh, she used to be before she was married. I can't think of her first name, her last name before she was married to him. But, but she's. I mean, they work for us here, and they had just they've been down here two years now from there, from Detroit. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. don't know. I haven't met them yet, but, you know, there's always a chance. <laughs> yeah. You, well, come on. Come on down. Come on down to the studio. Unless you're looking for a job. I think we're hiring, too. We are. Yeah. Oh, so. well, I'm not looking for a job, but I'm always... I'm always down to travel, so. Well, come on. All right. Well, that'll be a lot of fun to have you down here. And Magic, am I supposed to show the cup again? Oh, got to show the cup one more time. You're going to have oh, this. Okay. Listen, I want a picture of you, Sarah, drinking out of one of these cups. These are some really, these are some special cups. Here. In fact, oh, you know, okay. For yeah, sure. I want to see you with your favorite beverage in there. Maybe some vodka or some tequila or something <laughs> like that. Sipping on that there. All right. Okay. And Patrick, and Patrick do doesn't get one. Listen, thank you so much again. <laughs> I would like to thank everyone. Our program on Thursday is going to be on uh, ECMO. And it's, as I said, it's going to be Chris Lusby. We're going to talk about patient selection. We're going to talk about um, about the adequacy. How do you measure that? We're going to talk about all kinds of different cannulation techniques. We're going to talk about our own experiences, his experiences, how we're managing anticoagulation, how we're managing weaning, all of that stuff. And that's going to be on the Thursday program this Thursday coming up in two days. So we're looking forward to seeing all of you there. I think we had great participation this, uh, this, this particular one. And I, uh, I can't be, um, I can't be any happier. Thank you very much. And we're looking forward to seeing you on Thursday. And don't forget, you're going to get the, uh, the uh, survey monkey evaluation for today's program that you need to fill out and get, get done as soon as you can. Uh, you'll probably get it sometime tomorrow. And then as soon as you get that and send it back to us, we send the certificate out to you for uh, your 2.5 ABCP CEUs. Patrick, any final words? Nope. Thank you. Right. Well, well then thank you all very much. Until next time, au revoir.